Okay. So, hello everyone、uh, and happy new year. And thanks so much for coming. My name is Kaori Nagai. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Kent. And I'm the principal investigator of the AHRC networking project, Rethinking Fables in the Age of Global Environmental Crisis, which explores new theories and approaches to the fable genre. We are currently running a series of species based workshops, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's session on spider fables. Entitled as As the Spider Extended to Web, One's Destiny Unfolds, the Cultural Value of Spiders. We have an exceptional lineup of spider experts as speakers. They are Albert Holsing Himeles, Cass Lynch, and Nathan Morehouse. And my special thanks to Professor Lisa Jean Moore, another spider enthusiast, for putting together this amazing session. And sharing it today. So, Lisa Jean Moore is a medical sociologist and SUNY distinguished professor of sociology and gender studies at Pertis College. And her scholarship is located at the intersections of the sociology of health and medicine, science and technology studies, feminist studies, body studies, and animal studies. And she has studied some very interesting, rather unusual animals. Her books include An Ethnography of Honeybees, entitled Bee Buzz, Urban Beekeeping and the Power of the Bee, 2014, New York University Press, co authored with Mary Coast. Her monograph, Cat and Release The Enduring Yet Vulnerable Horseshoe Crab, 2018. Examine the interspecies relationships between humans and Atlantic horseshoe crabs. And it is very interesting for us here today to note that the horseshoe crabs are relatives of spiders. Her most recent book, Our Transgenic Future Spider Goats, Genetic Modification and the Will to Change Nature, 2022, is an ethnography about the creation of the spider goat. A genetically modified goat that lactates spider silk. The book focuses on how these spider goats came into existence, the researcher who maintains them, the funders who have made their lives possible, and how they fit into the larger science of transgenic and synth synth synthetics. On that note, I will pass you over to the chair, Lisa Jean. Um, thank you again. And then,、uh, Lisa Jing, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry to jump the gun before.、Um, really, really excited to be here. And I just want to encourage everybody to mute themselves if you haven't already, just so we don't have background noise. I know my audio is a little off, so I'm not going to speak very much.、Um, yeah, so I've worked with spiders when I've written an ethnography about、uh, North Atlantic horseshoe crabs, which are a relative of. Of、um, spiders or are in the spider category. And I just finished a book about spider goats, which are goats that are transgenically modified, as Kauri said, to lactate spider silk、um, through、um, the golden orb weaver spider's DNA.、Um, really excited to have the panel here today.、Um, I've been in touch with everyone and just got a brief glimpse of their slides. And I know we're in for a multidisciplinary, fantastic. Um, opportunity to learn about spiders from a bunch of different perspectives and to learn about different fables with, which relate to spiders.、Um, the title of our presentations today, or of the, of the total panel, is from a voodoo slash、um, West African proverb about spiders. And I hope that's a good springboard to leap into what everybody said. We agreed we're going to go in first name alphabetical order. So we're going to start with Alberto, then we'll move on to Cass, and then we'll close up with Nathan.、Um, I think since、um, we are interested in hearing also having a conversation, I'm not going to end my comments here. I'm going to move on to Alberto. Alberto,、um, I will text you when you have maybe two minutes to go,、um, just so that you're aware、um, through the chat feature. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but you'll, I'll send it directly to you just so that you'll see a chat feature so that we can keep on time, so that we have a little bit of time at the end. Alberto, unfortunately, 
um, needs to leave a little bit early from this session. So maybe if you are thinking of comments, you can think to include him immediately after we're done with each uh, of the three, the three presidents. We're gonna save comments to the end, okay? I'm gonna mute myself and move on to Alberto and Powery's gonna share his slides. Okay, uh, Alberto, can you see, see the slides? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, so, well, thank you very much, uh, Carrie and Lisa Jean, for the invitation. I'll be um, interrupting every now and then my talk just to indicate carry to um uh, please move on to the next slide i hope that doesn't prove too much of a nuisance um i mean i thought i'd start by saying that i hesitate to think of myself as a spider expert uh, but i am interested in traps and entrapments in the anthropology of traps and entrapments and spider webs do of course play a prominent role as cross-cultural technologies of capture and captivation so in this uh, talk, I'd like to introduce you to three spidery cultural complexes today. I shall draw from well-known descriptions uh, in the ethnographic record, but shall compare and analogize them in ways that hopefully will help us reassess the lure and affordances of spider human entanglements. Um, can you move on to the, to the next slide, please, Carrie? So let me start with the epigraph in my opening slides, which is the slide you can see now, which comes from Brian Burkhart's recent 2019 book, Indigenizing Philosophy Through the Land. In this book, uh, Burkhart, who's a citizen of the Cherokee nation of Oklahoma, develops a stimulating proposal that uses a trickster methodology for rethinking our environmental and earthly relations. By impersonating the character of Iktomi, the Lakota spider trickster, and artfully weaving in and around um, his own authorial self, uh, Burkhart opens up his writing to the philosophical affordances of indigenous trickster stories. The ambiguous magnetism of such stories, where trickster characters come across as sometimes humorous and charming, sometimes frivolous or perverse, draws those who listen into the intense groundings of local presence and relationships. I can move on to the next slide, please, Kari. Um, a trickster like Iktomi, writes Burkhardt, can lead you to spin and wrap yourself in the same webs that he spins around himself. As a, tri as a spider trickster, however, he can do this in such a way that he will show you how to how you wrapped this web around yourself in the first place. This creates the space for you to be able to see how to get out of the web of your own making. So when we strive to disentangle ourselves from specific relations in order to gain distance and analytical judgment, we're only re-entangling and re-grounding ourselves back into other sets of relationships. A trickster methodology argues Burkhardt holds this double movement of disentangling and re-entanglement in view at all times, and in so doing alerts us to the fact that we are always guests, and in this sense accountable also to the land that hosts us. Iktomi, the spider trickster of the Lakota, shares in this respect some traits with, the Anans with Anansi the spider, the famous trickster figure of the Akan people in central and southern Ghana, including the Ashanti, Fanti, and Akwafabem ethnic groups. Anansi is always depicted as a man with a full-fledged family, a wife and four children, who spends most of his time commuting between the human, non-human, and supernatural worlds, cheating, generating cultural phenomena, committing adultery, fooling, and being fooled. In this, he is not unlike Dure, the spider trickster of the Azambi people of Central Africa, who is described in the tales as having three wives and being a prototype of 
and a kind of skit on the Zandi Bakumba, a middle-aged man of substance. Kwesi Yanka, who studied the Akan trickster cycle in depth, emphasized that Anansi was never represented as a divinity in the tales. <clears throat> he is just, excuse me, he is just a human-like Buffon and a trickster who defies extraterrestrial boundaries and creates humor and irony by rubbing shoulders with and outwitting his physical, mental, social, and religious superiors. Edward Evans Preacher, who compiled and commented on the Tudor tales, similarly reported that there is only one theme in the Tudor tales, that of the trick, and further observed that these are stories that adults do not tell unless there are children present, for they are essentially stories for children. Now, two themes that are not uncommon to find across um, spider trickster stories are those of the obligations of hospitality and in-law hostility, whether respect owed to guests and hosts or to mothers-in-law and brothers-in-law takes ambivalent parasitic shapes and where expressions of guilt, shame or humiliation are renegotiated or camouflaged under the veil of joking relationships. There's a relations that, as Evans Pritchard put it in the case of the two details, involve respect and reserve and tension on both sides, and which perhaps for this reason explains what, why they are conflated with the seductive yet predatory qualities of spider machinations. Tricksters can indeed be cunning and manipulative, but they are rarely abstract, absent-minded, or theoretical. They may lure you into playing with or abdicating from your webs of obligations and interconnections, but such trickster temptations are almost always hunted by their own relational entrapments. In the last instance, tricksters are victims, occasionally, victors, too, of their own urges and fancies. As such, trickster spiders are always caught up in messiness, in the messiness and ordinariness of power struggles. In this sense, it must be noted that the duplicities, dilemmas, and tribulations of Iktomi, Anansi, and Tude are markedly gendered, for they are all male spiders. They enforce, in this regard, a classic trickster prototype. As Franchot Ballinger once put it, no woman is safe to long from a trickster's penis. It is for this reason especially interesting to note how and when, in folk tales and mythic stories, spiders take on female attributes. I can't but reference in this context the transatlantic journey and transformation of Anansi on the back of the slave trade circuit from the coast of West Africa to the Caribbean. Although Anansi stales male spider as he becomes a folk hero in Jamaican Creole culture, she becomes Aunt Nancy for African-American women in the US, where her image as a spider weaver becomes a symbol for the creative resistance of connective work. In this guise, Aunt Nancy resembles spider grandmother, the native North American goddess who showed humans the path to our world and the means to enjoy a flourishing existence. One hoppy myth describes, for example, how spider grandmother assisted humans in their search for a hole in the sky that would enable them to cross from the underground into the fourth world, our current destination. She sent her warrior grandsons to find Chipmunk, the planter, to plant a bamboo tree, and then taught people songs to make the tree grow. Spider grandmother hailed the people to sing the bamboo into the sky until it finally made it through the Sipapuni, the whole of emergence into the world. The workings of spider grandmother thus create connections between species 
between chipmunk, plants, and people, and between modes of generation and inhabitation, singing, growth, and emergence. She weaves pathways and openings and demonstrates the deep interconnections necessary to keep the holes of emergence open. <clears throat> Sorry, could you mind um, moving on to the next slide, Karen? Thank you. Interconnectedness is another way of speaking of the kinship modality as the ground of locality, writes Brian Burkhardt. And spider grandmother's creative power as manifested through her spinning webs is an image of this kinship modality. Spider grandmother's web is an image of kinship itself and is instructive of the power of creating new kinship relations, as well as the fundamental importance and precariousness of kinship as a foundation of knowing and being that must be maintained and even constantly created anew. We find similar images of spidery gestation, kinning, and emergence in a very different part of the world. Andrew Latters, who has carried ethnographic fieldwork amongst the Mali baining of Papua New Guinea, has described how their secret myths claim. Can you move on to the next slide, please? How the Bailing's, uh, Bailing's secret myths claim that at the very beginning of time, there was a ground or anything else. There was only an original bilum, a net bag or womb. It hung from the sky by a rope. In effect, a cosmic umbilical cord. It dripped blood and amniotic fluids before it finally came down from the sky to form the soft ground. It formed the earth, which is the second version of the celestial womb, being an alternative material version of the primary cosmic film. It took God various attempts, however, to compact the fluids and soft tissue of the descending womb into a solid earth. First, it tried by shaking and coalescing the ground with an earthquake, but it broke apart. Next, he inserted trees and stones that would help cement the ground. But when tested with another earthquake, it crumbled once more. Only when God's cosmic sister wife asked him to have another go, did the earth stay strong? Andrew Latter's informants explained to him that the presence of God's, God's cosmic wife sister proved indispensable for only the cosmic interdependence of male and female can beget anything new. As Latter's put it, the sister wife, and I quote, brings a sexualized cosmos into existence revealing how acts of worldly creation must participate in a cosmic coupling of the male and the female. Can you move on, move on to the next slide, please? Now, you may be asking yourself, what is spidery about this cosmology? So let me quote Latters at some length. The celestial robe that held the original warm is often likened to a spider's thread. The delicate threads and patterns of a spider's web are seen as reproduced in the net bags woven by women. The Mali word for spider's web, masar, refers to weaving a net bag. Spiders feature heavily in baining myths and folk tales, such as the mythic analogy of the moon as a spider, as the star that climbs higher every night, weaving its web. Baining masks depict the patterned webs of the spider. I, that is Latus, interprets them as unifying masks that incorporate the diversity of other masks into the celestial origins they mirror and embody. Spider masks span and ritually weave together again the different strengthening aspects of earthly existence into the cosmic web womb from which everything came and now secretly still exists. Can you move on to the next slide, please? Now, so far, I've patched together a variety of spider myths and stories from different parts of the world. Anthropologists would be scandalized, with good reason, if I attempted a comparative analysis on the grounds of such a diverse and uncontextualized set of materials. 
So I most certainly won't offer one. But as Marilyn Strathairn once noted, if insufficiency of context makes comparability sterile, perhaps one should aim for a compatibility instead. For whereas comparability aims for and presumes totality, compatibility is not intrinsic to anything and is happy to work on the basis of provisional and ad hoc partial connections. So what may, what may make this variegated uh, accounts uh, compatible? Well, for a start, we have spiders that are tricksters. These tricksters are characters in folk tales rather than myths. They have no trappings of the sacred, as Quaid's Yanka once put it, and are better considered as fiction. Although, admittedly, as Evans Pritchard noted in his study on the Zandi trickster, the distinction between myth and folk tale is often uh, blurred uh, in these tales. Now, while tricksters are not sacred and generally display human bodies, they are sometimes characterized as shapeshifters can travel between earthly and celestial worlds and have supernatural abilities also. They're often in the middle and in between, in between humans and animals, earth and sky, the sacred and the mundane. So for this reason, I shall call this trickster spiders cloud spiders. Not unimportantly, cloud spiders are generally men whose cunning and mani manipulative skills are directed at mocking or taking advantage of, but not subverting the status quo. An exception would be Anansi, the trickster folk hero of anti-colonial struggle in Jamaica. What I shall call sky spiders, on the other hand, tend to be female figures, such as the spider grandmother of the Pueblo cultures or the spider moon of the Bayaning. There are godlike beings whose actions not only help bring the world into existence, but warrant its ongoing flourishing and sustainability. Unlike cat spiders, who are often unilaterally obsessed with sex and power, sky spiders demonstrate a profound understanding of the gendered interdependencies of creativity and kinning across multi-species relations, including plants, animals and humans. Having said this, cloud spiders prove also surprisingly savvy and articulate as they navigate the ordinariness and messiness of the mundane. An appreciation about the empiricism of everyday life that is evidently missing from the cosmogonical doings and designs of sky spiders. So let me bring to the talk to an end by describing the last in my trio of spiders, the earth spider. I shall draw for this purpose on Ernesto de Martino's classic ethnographic study on Tarantism in Southern Italy. Tarantism describes a cultural phenomenon where men and women who report being bitten by a tarantula spider experience sudden melancholia, self-abandonment and bodily convulsions and aches symptoms that were often medicalized as lactrodectism. However, the Tarantati, the people bitten by the spider, only responded to music. And to facilitate their recovery, their families would sponsor musicians at great cost to come over to their homes and play the popular regional Tarantella for long hours, not infrequently for various days in a row for it was believed that only the music could exorcise the spider spirit out from the body. Although in principle, anyone could be bitten by a spider, in practice, it was overwhelmingly women who became tarantati, not once, but on numerous occasions over their lives. The word used to describe the bite of spiders in Italian is rimorso, which it means also remorse. It was said that it was often the same spider or its offspring that bit people again, thus emphasizing the unique melodic and effective resonance existing between the tarantati, the people bitten by the spider, the spider itself, 
and the music that orchestrates the choreography of the ritual dance. Different spiders responded to different rhythms, pitches, or musical phrases. As the Martino put it, <clears throat> can you move on to the next slide, please? Sorry, and, and the next slide also. That that's a um that image was an image of a of an exorcism of a or tarantism exorcism. So as De Martino put it, it is above all necessary to mimic the dance of the little spider, the tarantella. Following an irresistible identification, it is necessary to dance with the spider, indeed be the dancing spider. But at the same time, it is necessary to make an actual agonistic movement be felt, the superimposition and imposition of one's own choreotic rhythm upon that of the spider, forcing the spider to dance until it's tired, pursuing it as it flees the chasing food, or squashing it and stamping it as the food violently beats the floor to the rhythm of the tarantella. The tarantato executes the dance of the little taranta as a victim possessed by the beast and as a hero who subdues the beast by dancing. This is carried out through the tension between identification and agonistic detachment, letting go and regaining oneself and making oneself a spider and dancing the spider. Spiders, <coughs> excuse me, spiders bite predominantly during the hot season the harvest season of the summer fruits. It was at this time that grain growing communities were exposed to the dangerous encounters with poisonous, poisonous animals hidden in the wheat fields and the fierce heat of the Mediterranean summer. According to the Martino, these were the months where women could more easily find an outlet to vent their frustrations at the conditions of the patriarchal subjugation and peasant bondage of agricultural society. In this sense, the bites and rebites, rimorso in Italian, of the spider epitomized the complex cultural structure of this Mediterranean society, a land of remorse for women. So we have three spiders then, earth, cloud, and sky whose improbable and partial connections outline a series of transformational themes. In their different ways, all spiders weave and hold worlds of multi-species, gender, and place-based relations in precarious balance. Yet whereas the webs that earth spiders weave are fragmented and spasmodic, and can only temporarily accomplish cyclical and emotional redemption for subaltern forms, the sky spiders lay out cosmic charters for regenerative kinship across all living beings. Cloud spiders, for their part, stand emblematically in the middle, borrowing, messing, and manipulating regimes and registers from all worlds. Earth, cloud, and sky. This may be their names, but it is our task to decipher which spiders have spun the different entanglements that capture and captivate us today. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Alberto. I learned a lot and I really appreciate um, the time and effort that it took to yeah. give your talk. Um, I unfortunately don't see Cass here right now. I don't know if she got off. Cass, are you here? Um, I think in the interest of time then, Nathan, do you mind um, doing your presentation now and hopefully Cass will be able to log back in? Yeah, no problem at all. Awesome. And I'm going to text you when you have two minutes through the chat feature, just so you know. Okay. And just a heads up that I did not uh, practice this talk, so I have no idea how long it is. Okay. Okay, uh, but no yeah, I appreciate, no I appreciate your heads up when we when okay. we get uh, close to time here. So um, wonderful, yeah, and you can just share your screen whenever you else. Yeah, great. I should have given a well. I suppose everybody is here expecting to see spiders, but I'd sometimes give a a, a trigger warning when I show a big spider very quickly. Um, 
So my name is Nate Morehouse, and I'm a, a research biologist and faculty member at the University of Cincinnati, and I'm just really delighted to be here. Um, I run a large research team of about 18 people, but I also run a research institute called the Institute for Research and Sensing that um, specifically plays in this space between science and technology, as well as the humanities the social sciences and the fine and performing arts. So I love these spaces and I really appreciate Kauri and Lisa um, inviting me. Um, today, I'm, I'm gonna talk uh, mostly about jumping spiders, but I thought I'd begin just by um, giving a, a really quick overview, which actually Albert, Alberto has already helped us to see, which is that spiders feature in fables and mythologies around the world. So they have captivated humans of all cultures. Of course, uh, Anansi being a, a very clear example of this from the Akan people in Africa, um, European, Cultures also have a number of spiders that appear like Arachne, the mortal who challenged Athena to a weaving competition um, and then was cursed by Athena because of Athena's pride to become a spider-like creature. Um, we already heard quite a bit about Iktomi, which is a trickster spider being the, uh, told by the Lakota people here in North America. And uh, in Japan, we have the Suchi Gumo, which are earth spiders. And uh, one thing I want to point out is that uh, although many of the trickster myths like Anansi and Iktomi are very uh, male gendered in terms of the figures, many of the places around the world that we see spider beings, those, indiv those individuals are uh, also female gendered like Arachne and the, the Suchi Gumu. Uh, many of those are, are represented as women. And, and then of course there are um, artifacts like the Nazca lines that imply that cultures that we don't have access to their oral traditions also held spiders as important figures in their worlds. Um, many of these stories, as Alberto has communicated, involve trickster figures or they involve a highlighting of webs um, and uh, uh, the intelligence of, of these spider, uh, uh, spider beings. Uh, I'm going to actually draw today from a slightly different type of fable. It's unusual in the canon of spider fables, um, partly because I think the purpose of our discussion today is not just to think about the historical context of spider fables, but also to reimagine re or think forward into what spider fables might be. And so what I'd like to share is a very short Aesop uh, fable called The Fly in St. Paul's Cupola. Um, and uh, this is really a fable about subjective experience, and I think it's delightful to introduce what I wanted to share with everybody today. So this is a conversation between a fly and a spider, and as a fly was crawling leisurely up one of the columns of St. Paul's cupola, she often stopped, surveyed, examined, and at last broke forth into the following exclamation, Strange that anyone who pretended to be an artist should leave so superb a structure with so many roughnesses unpolished. So she's thinking about the rough surface from her vantage point of the columns themselves. Ah, my friend, said a very learned architect who hung in his web under one of the capitals, you should never decide of things beyond the extent of your capacity. This lofty building was not erected for such diminutive animals as you and I, but for a certain sort of creatures who are at least 10,000 times as large. To their eyes, it is very possible these columns may appear as smooth as to you appear the wings of your favorite mistress. So here, what we have is this concept that one should be careful about judgment because subjective experiences differ. Um, and the world that my research lives in is to try to understand the unique subjective experiences of flies, butterflies, and spiders. And the observation here that vision uh, may differ or vantage point may differ between individuals or between different kinds of animals or beings 
is really at the heart of our work. So what I wanted to share with you today, potentially as inspiration for what Spider Fables might look like as we look into the future, I wanted to share with you some of our research on how jumping spiders see the world. Uh, this is a subjective world that they inhabit that we really can only imagine our way into, but we do so assisted by some technology and some um, scientific commitments around how we understand what their world might be for them. So um, if any of you have interacted with the jumping spider, uh, you know that these animals are very curious. Uh, they are intelligent. We know that they can make plans for the future. We know that they can potentially count up to four. Uh, they're really quite clever animals. They're tiny. They're about the size of your pinky fingernail at largest. And they move through the world. In contrast to most of the spiders in mythology, which are web building spiders, jumping spiders don't build webs. They can produce silk, but they use it as a drag line support system for their locomotion through the world. And instead, they hunt. And many of the trickster spiders in mythology do move freely through the world in this way as well. Not only do they navigate the world with really keen vision, which I'm going to tell you quite a bit about today, but they also have really um, elaborate ritualistic interactions with each other that take advantage of their sharp vision. So here is a peacock jumping spider from Australia. This is the male of the species, and he's currently courting a female that is off screen. You'll see her in just a minute. He's doing this with vibratory song, as well as these elaborate movements and colors. And he's really quite hesitant to approach her here because for these spiders and many other jumping spider species, females are voracious predators that will oftentimes choose to eat the male before he has a chance to mate with her rather than to allow him to mate. Something that goes by the scientific name pre-copulatory sexual cannibalism. So many of these communicatory uh, interactions are struck through with high risk for the, the players involved. So this earlier um, video that I played you here, when you see these animals, if they recognize you from a windowsill, or from the corner of your shower, they'll oftentimes turn to face you. And the reason for that is not because they can't see you behind them. As a matter of fact, jumping spiders have a full hemisphere of vision that allows them to see the world around them. But their best vision is concentrated in the forward facing eyes that look out uh, in front of them. And these are the eyes that I wanna tell you a bit more about today. There's two pairs of eyes here, um, the anterior lateral, or what we sometimes call the secondary eyes, and the anterior medial, which we sometimes call the principal eyes. And if we were to slice through the animal that you just looked like, uh, looked at, so that we're looking down inside the head, this is what that would look like. Then I wanna begin by focusing on these secondary or anterior lateral eyes, they have small lenses here on the outside of the body and then a flat sheet-like retina position behind it. And we're able to use technologies very similar to those that your eye doctor might use called ophthalmoscopes to look in through the lens of those eyes in live spiders to image the underlying retina. And each of these little coffee bean shaped bright dots here are individual photoreceptors akin to the cone cells in your retina. Now, when we do this, we can only see a small portion of the retina, but by rotating the animals carefully we, uh, and taking multiple images, we can stitch together a full view of the retinas of those anterior lateral eyes. And this allows us to figure out how much of the world this retina is able to see, as well as in what kind of detail. And so what we know about these anterior lateral eyes is that they have broad fields of view that um, overlap in the center uh, of their uh, body axis here, but uh, give them a broad field of view with fairly modest resolution. So in the center of these retinas, they can see things as being distinct objects in space if they're only 0.4 degrees apart. 
in the world outside. I'll give you some um, tether points for what that number actually means. So we'll return to this number in a minute. We also know that for many species of jumping spiders, these retinas are only sensitive to green light. So this is monochromatic or black, what we might call black and white vision. But it's a big field of view. They're highly sensitive to light. They're sensitive to motion and they have modest resolution. So this part of their visual world or their visual system operates a bit like our peripheral vision. The big eyes in the center of the head are built entirely differently. And they're actually built differently than just about any eye on the planet. So although they have large lenses on the outside of the head, their retinas are these tiny little uh, um, patches all the way back here at the end of a very long eye tube. And these eyes are really built like telescopes. So they have that large lens, which you can see on the outside of the head, that focuses an image down this long fluid filled eye tube, at the bottom of which is a second lens that magnifies that image onto that tiny underlying layered retina. And this works along the same principles as telephoto lenses or binoculars or a Galilean telescope. The result is that you get a magnified image at the level of the retina. That retina is really oddly shaped as well. Um, so um, uh, uh, the, it is tiered, it's boomerang shaped, and light coming through that lens system traverses four distinct layers of photoreceptive cells. So here's what this looks like in a real animal instead of an illustration. Here is that boomerang shaped retina, light coming through that corneal lens and then through that pit lens traverses these four distinct layers of photoreceptive cells. And just to give you a better impression of what this is like, here we're using that ophthalmoscope, but we're focusing down in, you see one layer with its pattern of photoreceptors and then the next layer is gonna emerge with a slightly different pattern below, okay? So, and there are four of these. Um, the combination of those unusual lens optics and the incredibly tight packing of these little light sensitive cells in these four layers of the retina allow these animals to have extraordinary spatial acuity or the ability to see fine pattern and detail in the world. So if you remember those lateral eyes had an ability to see objects that were 0.4 degrees apart in space, these principal eyes are able to see things as distinct that are 0 0.07 degrees apart in space. Another consequence of this, the lens system is that they have very, very narrow fields of view, a bit like if you had binoculars up to your eyes. So I told you I would try to situate some of these numbers in a broader context. This is that broader context here. This is a very common relationship for animal vision compared to animal body size. So here's body size down here, larger animals off to the right, smaller animals to the left. And here is that measure of spatial acuity or how fine of detail in the world these animals can see with sharper vision being down below and coarser vision being up above. So to give you some tether points here, fruit flies have very poor vision. They're small animals and things need to be almost five degrees apart in space for them to see them as being distinct objects or distinct points of light. You can feel rather smug about yourself because at least in our fovias, we can detect things as being distinct if they're 0 0.007 degrees apart in space. And that allows you to read, for example, the characters on the screen right now so that you're able to follow along with what I'm saying. We're not the best. Um, a number of birds of prey exceed our visual acuity. And of course that helps them to see small animals at great distances when they're hunting. Um, but where do jumping spiders fall? The, this relationship suggests, in, in other words, that in order to make eyes that can see the world well, you need to be a large animal because those eyes need to be big. But of course, jumping spiders are small. 
So let's put those secondary eyes on here. And you can see that these animals are small, but they're already outperforming all of their peers. They can see with those secondary eyes, the world about as, bet as well as a dragonfly, which is um, it, the dragonfly's eyes are actually bigger than the entire body of one of these jumping spiders. So they're already doing extraordinary things. What about those principal eyes that I just talked about? Well, they're way off the line. So jumping spiders are really breaking the traditional pattern of spatial acuity in relationship to body size that we tend to see across animals. So what, how, are the, how do they measure up? Well, they're better than a cat or a lap dog. They're about as good as some pretty sharp visioned birds like pigeons and chickens. They actually outperform elephants in terms of their ability to see pattern in the world. Okay, the, la the last thing that I wanna tell you about is this retina and, and how that works in terms of sensing wavelengths of light or color. So one thing that we um, that people observed early on was that the retina was tiered and also that the lenses that um, were being used by these eyes have a common problem common to most lens systems, which is that they lenses tend to focus short wavelength light like ultraviolet, violet, and blue closer to themselves than long wavelength light. This is like a prism here. Uh, it has to do with the refraction of light. And these lenses tend to focus different colors of light at different depths. So one early idea about why the retina itself might be tiered is that these tiers might allow the animals to place the correct color sensitive cells at the right distance behind the lenses so that the images that they were responding to were in correct focus. And it turns out that this is true, that the ultraviolet photoreceptors tend to be in these upper tiers where ultraviolet images are gonna be in best focus and the green sensitive photoreceptors are going to be down below uh, uh, where their images are gonna be in best focus. So in other words, this chromatic aberration is organizing the where they place different color sensitive cells in these unusual retinas. One issue with this though, is that this is uh, the color vision system, it's a very rudimentary color vision system for these animals here, Hesarius adansoni, they're pretty drab animals, they're native to the Southeast Asia, but many jumping spiders are brightly colored, and this is where we really entered the picture of color vision with jumping spiders about five years ago. Because the challenge is that if they were using a color vision system with just ultraviolet and green sensitive cells, that all of those reds and oranges and yellows that you saw a minute ago would not be visible to these animals. And so this was an early problem that we needed to solve is how are they seeing these bright reds, oranges, and yellows that they're using to communicate with each other? And what we found was in this group of North American jumping spiders, they have a filter built into their retina that shifts the sensitivity of a bunch of cells underneath it to red, orange, or yellow. So they are trichromatic like we are, able to see reds, oranges, and yellows. Most jumping spiders cannot, but this allows these animals to see the world a bit like this. And actually integrating all of the information that I just told you about those monochromatic secondary eyes and these principal eyes, it turns out that that color vision is restricted to a very small spot in the center here and most of their world still looks black and white to them. But what about some of these other colorful groups? These are those peacock jumping spiders from Australia, and we assessed whether they had retinal filters, and they don't. Instead, they have evolved new color sensitivities like blue and yellow to augment their color vision. And so they are a bit more like birds that have four different color sensitive cell types. And we've been on a journey around the world, including to measure things like Lacerti's rainbow spider in India to try to understand why some of these jumping spiders are colorful and how do they see color in their world and repeatedly we're finding that jumping spiders around the world in very unrelated groups are evolving novel and distinct ways of seeing color better in their worlds. 
Um, so we're developing a bit of a compendium, if you will, or a catalog of all of the ways that jumping spiders have evolved to see color in their world better, even though most jumping spiders can't see it very well at all. So this work is really helping us to get into this subjective world of jumping spiders to think about why some of them are interacting with color in different minute in, in um in, in in different ways. Some of them are drab and some of them are really brightly colored. So I'm going to scoot through just in my last minute here one last detail about jumping spider vision that blows my mind every time I think about it and maybe will blow your mind too. Um, and that is that jumping spiders interact with these very colorful and dy dynamic displays, but they do so in, a, in ways that are hidden to us typically. So um, I mentioned that these unusual principal eyes are a bit like um, binoculars and you would never drive down the road with binoculars in front of your eyes because you can only see a small part of the world, even though you can see it in high detail. And one of the things that I hadn't mentioned yet is that although these fields of view for these eyes are very small, they are able to move the field of view of these eyes around the world in front of them, thanks to these blue muscles represented here that actually move the retina around inside the head of these spiders so that the retina is looking at different angles through the lenses to different parts of the world. And you really have to see it to believe it. So here's a jumping spiderling. And you can see, hopefully, on the inside of its head, these long eye tubes with the retinas at the very back moving around as it tracks this brush that comes in and out of the frame off to the right. Now, when these animals get to be a bit older, their bodies become opaque, and so we're no longer able to look in from the outside, at least through the side of the head. Instead, we have to look in with those ophthalmoscopes through the, um, through the lenses themselves, and we can play them videos like this little moving dot and watch as these boomerang-shaped retinas track the movement of things in their world. And so we can actually even do this while displaying them some of these courtship videos here. And this allows us to track where, for example, females look when males are displaying to them during courtship. And this enables us to begin to understand where females concentrate their attention when they are viewing these complicated movement and color displays that males engage in. Um, and so with that, I'll just end there. Happy to take questions at the question period of time. But this is uh, the effort, not just of me, but a huge group of people at a variety of institutions around the US and around the world, uh, lots of folks. And um, thanks to the National Science Foundation and uh, a couple of university affiliates for their support of this. Um, but hopefully this offers some inroads into new ways we can imagine spiders, not just as tricksters and weavers and storytellers, but also as intelligent communicators and sharp-sided denizens of our planet. That was great. I learned so much and I'm so grateful also for all the beautiful cinematography, amazing, beautiful work. Um, so now we're gonna move quickly on to Cass because we wanna make sure we have a couple, a little bit of time for questions. So Cass, I'm gonna let you know. Oh no, wait, are you not there now? Yes, you were just there. You were texting. Yes. Oh, there you are. are. Sorry. Okay, I see you. Perfect. <laughs> so, why don't you share your screen, and I will chat with you to let you know when you have about two minutes. Yeah, I might put my alarm on for eighteen minutes. Does that sound about right? Oh yeah, yeah, that's perfect. You have twenty minutes total, so yeah. So, and it's okay if you go a couple minutes over. I just want like to try and keep it moving. Okay, awesome. Take yeah, it away. No. So, share my screen. Ready to go. All right, uh, thanks uh, to everyone. Fascinating so far. I don't wanna brag, Nathan, but I've got Maratus pavonis in my front yard, the uh, common peacock spider. 
and your talk has uh um, my your your talk has uh uh intrigued me because they really do spin around like they're Batman or they're like uh power rangers like they can't they have to move their whole heads and it's that binocular vision at the front when they're seeing me looming over them with my iPhone and they get horrified um so yeah thanks guys uh all right so my talk has a little bit of context but I will get to spiders I promise uh Kaya my name is Cass Lynch and my contribution is called aunties and uncles in the undergrowth writing from the perspective of our more than human kin I'm zooming in from the city of Perth, situated on a coastal plain in the southwest of the Australian continent. I'm a Goreng Wujari Noongar woman. Uh, we are the First Nations people, and uh, our perception of the Australian continent doesn't quite align with the state lines you see on this map, but looks something more like this. There are around 250 Aboriginal nations on the continent and its islands, and I'm part of the Whirlman mob, and we are the Bushstone Curlew people, uh, which is a long-legged scrub bird. So here I am in the southwest, uh, in Perth, on the Swan Coastal Plain, which is the traditional lands of the Wadjuk people, and which is one of the 14 Noongar clans. You guys might have heard of an acknowledgement of country before when done by... Oops, you might have heard of a acknowledgement of country before, when done by non-Indigenous peoples, it's usually spoken before an important meeting or an event or a project, and you acknowledge that you're dwelling, making a living, and perhaps raising a family on land that was invaded during the period of European colonial expansion and never meaningfully returned. When Indigenous people do acknowledgements of country, it's to pay respect and honour the traditional custodians of the territory, it's part of Indigenous protocol uh, to do so when you enter someone's lands or, as of, is often the case, if you live and work away from your own territory. So the territory that my clan are responsible for and obligated to is the south coast, which is that little arrow at the bottom. Um, so I will do acknowledgement of country. I acknowledge the elders of Wajuk country, the traditional custodians of this land and water, a place populated by people, animals, plants and spirits. I acknowledge the Wajuk people as the first caretakers of this place and whose knowledges I hold in high esteem. I keep elders in mind in this Zoom environment, which is often a space devoid of horizon and territory, obscuring sovereignty. Nalak Karich Kora Kora, where ye mot nija wajak bujak were kep. So I'm a writer and researcher. I did my PhD on Aboriginal stories that reference sea level rise and climate change. And I'm currently a postdoctoral research fellow at Curtin University. I currently work in Noongar language revitalization, which is the First Nations language of the Southwest here. My postdoc feature uh, focuses on just the South Coast Noongar dialect, and our project produces bilingual books which feature our dreaming stories. Where are you? There you are. Um, so we work toward helping Noongar language and culture to be organically passed down to the young ones again. Not a lot of my community speak Noongar fluently because of colonial assimilation policies where children were taken off their parents and raised in institutions in the hope that Noongar culture would disappear. Speaking the language was also banned. Our elders kept language alive during these dark times, which was most of the 20th century. And in the 1990s, energized efforts to um, start to return language and culture to those who were taken away was started. It's a huge task because it's not just one language to revitalise in Australia, it's 250. I learned my ancestral language during my PhD because some of the references to sea level rise and climate change were encoded in the Noongar language through word association. So speaking Noongar was an important part of generating good research. I researched the Holocene sea level rise, 
which is the rapid rise in sea level after the last ice age, which was about 20,000 years ago. Noongar people have been in the southwest since our time of creation, which Western science confirms that we've, been, we've dwelled here for at least 50,000 years. So we watched the seas rise when the ice age broke 18,000 years ago, and we're in the same place when the rise ceased and the seas leveled out 7,000 years ago. Humans all over the world witnessed this, but because Noongar people and other coastal indigenous people are still in the same place, that story hasn't been lost and it's still told today. I promise you I'm getting to spiders. When you research climate, you get into the deep cycles of the world. Long time frames measured in ages and epochs, million year droughts, continents drifting, life developing, life being wiped out, species rising, species dying away. You lose the present a little bit. It can be hard to focus and stay rooted and feel connected to culture and place. My early writing was about the geology of Noongar country because we have some of the oldest surface rock in the world. I could drive an hour inland from here and touch 2.8 billion year old granite and it's present, it's there, it's real. Um, I could touch the limestone here on the coastal plain and some is 150,000 years old, some is 800,000 years old. And so I could, you know, be in touch with the interglacials which builds and breaks coastlines. Um, the sand on the beaches here is really recent, almost ephemeral. Um, the beaches here are barely 7,000 years old. So there's something incredible about my community retaining eyewitness accounts of the Holocene sea level rise. So it has incentivized me to try and replicate or mimic our knowledge ways when conducting the research that I do. And I found that alignment currently with bringing the focus of my cultural responsibility your responsibilities to the Walbankara, which is the Noongar name for the trapdoor spider. Ooh, oh, sorry, this is a little bit of a uh, context for sea level rise stories. So the seas rose 120 metres in about 7,000 years in pulses, so it wasn't even. So you can see off Perth here, that's the old coastline. And so Noongar people lived all through here, not over here on the naturalist plateau that wasn't um, above sea level ever. But you can see the old coastline here and this Perth Canyon is, our, is where the river used to terminate. And so the river dug a canyon over, you know, like say a million years. Um, and then it was, you know, interglacial cycles, you know, ice builds up, the sea levels drop, the ice all melts and the seas rise. And so the river gets dug during that time. So that river say, you know, I'm not sure with climate change now, but every 150,000 years we have an ice age. And so that river will appear again, essentially. And uh, Noongar people saw that river, say 25,000 years ago, um, and where, you know, it, it will return again. So that was just a bit, a, bit, a bit of context about that. Oh, and there's a close up. So that's um, the Perth Canyon. It's about, the size of the Grand Canyon and its deepest point is four kilometers. So it really is, it's an, it's an ocean trench. So spiders, this is a um, special place in the Southwest. So we're up here in Perth, but you can see I've highlighted the Prongarup range. The Prongarup range is interesting in terms of climate because it is a rare place of elevation. Noongar country, the southwest here is very flat, so the climate is very even. But when you get to altitude, the um, you know, it gets colder and wetter, you know, further up mountains. And so this is Prongarup National Park, right? And Prongarup National Park is interesting because it is a leftover climate from Gondwana land. So Gondwana land was when Australia was connected with um, Antarctica and India, and it was forested and jungled, right? It was just a different climate. And when continents break up, uh, it creates a drying effect. And so that was the great drying of Australia. And, you know, we are known for our desert centre, but our edges are pretty green. But the Parongarups, right, 
because they have this um, 650 meter elevation, all that jungly, wet jungly stuff from Gondwana land is still there, right? And so when I was researching climate, essentially you could walk around some parts of the Southwest and you walk back in time, you know, you walk into this previous climate. There is a carry forest at the Prongarups, which shouldn't be there. You know, carries carry trees are a eucalypt that only grows in the far southwest on the Cape, which has like a million millimetres of rain a year. Everywhere else is really dry, but this is like this sky island of climate. And so when I was looking at places like this, where you find these leftover Gondwanan climates and landscapes, you find ancient spiders. And so... There are roughly two kinds of spiders. I think there's a third, don't quote me. The two major um, groups of spiders are modern spiders and ancient spiders. So modern spiders are the araniomorphs and they include kind of web builders, um, you know, like redbacks, black widows, most spiders, jumping spiders, um, orb weavers. So they all have like certain mouthpieces. They've got pincers, you know. Whereas the ancient spiders, the trapdoor spiders and the tarantulas, they've got up and down fangs. They've got ones that do this. And so they are, you know, roughly unchanged for about 150 million years. And so we wouldn't have any kind of Gondwan and trapdoor spiders if we didn't have these areas of elevation. Um, although I will say that other spiders have evolved from these spiders and gone into the lowlands. Um, but I came to find that, you know, I had this kind of focus on the geology of Noongar country to tell a story about this land that I'm descended from and where my ancestors um, dwell, and it felt a bit far away. And then I found that as a research focus that trapdoor spiders are telling a story of previous climates living in situ where they are. And so I started hanging out with trapdoor spiders essentially. So the Prongarups is just next to my country. It's not quite my territory. Um, oh, I've got a little video, but you can kind of see how it attracts its own climate. So that's just mist, just living at the tops of these granite hills. So this is why there's so much rain. Um, they're just like cloud forests essentially. Uh, this is me at, at the top of, the, at one, of one of the granite massifs. Um, so this is what the Prongarups looks like. And this is not usually what Noongar country looks like. Noongar country is very flat, whereas this is, you know, hilly and, and uh, elevated. Um, and so I started photographing uh, Cataxia bolganapensis, which is a armoured trapdoor spider um, that creates open-doored burrows. And so this is its environment. It's this very kind of like mossy, moist, shaded cool place and when you drive into the Prongarups the temperature drops and so it's quite hot here in the southwest and so you know it's like nature's air conditioning but these are my mates right so this is Cataxia bolganapensis they um, build burrows and have little palisades so they don't have a door they build yeah burrow palisades and because it is so moist in the Prongarups they don't need to put a door, they don't need to expend the energy to put a door on their burrow. When you see trapdoor spiders in our desert areas, they have a trapdoor to trap the um, moisture in, essentially, and it stops their silk from drying out. Ancient spiders, like um, tarantulas and trapdoors, don't like being caught out in the open because they dry out very easily because they have these kind of lungs on the outside of their body, whereas modern spiders can sit on webs in the sun because they have like a tracheal tube and their lungs are deeper in their body. And so ancient spiders, their adaptation is, is a burrowing adaptation. So they can get underground where the temperature is even. Um, and usually they have a door to trap the moisture or to keep predators out. But these guys live in some kind of paradise. And so they don't even, even build themselves a door against predators. Uh, so here are some more. Um, and so each one is different. And I found this really charming about um, cataxias is that they build with what, whatever's around them. So they are really are kind of like the spirit of place, um, building their homes, like 
like little individuals and all their burrows are different. And so these guys are interesting as well in terms of um, spiders in deep time is because they have quite long lifespans compared to other spiders, like our little mates, the peacock jumping spiders. Um, they might only live for a year or two. In fact, the male probably only live for less than a year. Um, whereas trapdoor spiders, the oldest one in the southwest here was 43 years old when she died, and she was killed by a wasp. She wasn't even like, she didn't even like die, you know, she was killed by a wasp. And so they have something like a human lifespan, right? And they do spend most of their life kind of like chilling in their burrows, but that is there. They have very slow metabolisms and this long lived in situ sort of um, lifestyle. And so when you see these spiders, I don't know if I've got a picture. Oh, so you can see in this one, there's two. So you'll have like a grandmother in the middle and then they only go 20 or 30 centimeters from their parent um and then they and then they have their babies and so you get a whole community of spiders within like a meter square and they the middle ones could be 50 years old and then 20 and then 10 or 5 the males don't reach sexual maturity until 7 years old so these are animals that really aren't like a lot of other arthropods you know so they kind of remind me like our community um, sing to whales on the south coast. They sing to southern right whales and humpbacks as part of our cultural um, expression. And, you know, whales have a long lifespan. Humans have a long lifespan and trapdoor spiders have a long lifespan. So, you know, this was part of my, you know, how do I talk about climate? You know, people are kind of overwhelmed by climate knowledge. There's a million climate um research papers and it's difficult for the world to wade through all this knowledge and so I wanted to do something different you know my community are people who tell stories about animals you know tell stories about animals about plants landforms and weather and how we're related to them so it felt culturally appropriate for me to focus on trapdoor spiders as something to share with the public to attach climate knowledge to something real um, and something that's quite vulnerable and you know, has lived for 150 million years in this place. Can we not create a world where they might be able to prevail? They can't run away like a kangaroo or a possum. They can't fly away like a cockatoo or coolbarity, the magpie. So they require a lot of care. And so I've, I've, you know, was photographing them and using them in my uh, presentations about climate. And then about two years into this, the local national parks announced a new path right and this path was going to go right over the top of this spider colony that I had been building a relationship with there's not a lot of research on uh, trapdoor spiders you know there's a bit of a like discovery sort of research trend where researchers will go out and name spiders but not advocate for them or even describe their ecology they essentially take spiders and then dna test them and you know they get names they get but they don't there's no other interaction other than that so i've taken this different approach i'm not an ecologist but i have my colleague is a trapdoor spider ecologist she's indigenous as well and we've been trying to find this other way to like research spiders without being like discovery bros about it but anyway i wasn't expecting this to come up this uh, new construction that was going to uh, just essentially concrete over the top of these burrows, some of them 40 to 50 years old. And so I had to get out of my sort of office five hours away in Perth and advocate for them. And so I was like, you know, this is an animal that I'm adopting as my totem. You know, this is, I have a thing to say about totems, but I might not have time. Um, this is an animal, you know, like Noongar people, elders share that because we were an oral culture, we retained deep knowledge of place through distribution of responsibility, right? So you don't have to know everything about Noongar country. You are given five boranga, and boranga like roughly translates to totem. And so a totem boronga is something that you're responsible for. So you might have, say, five. And this is in traditional culture prior to colonization. And so 
every every clan would have someone who's an expert in turtles or fire or cockatoos or carry trees. And there'd always be an older person, a younger person with the totem. So the older one could teach their knowledge as the young one grows up. And then the older one passes away and then another one is given that totem. So this is how you carry such a huge knowledge system. And totems mean like if someone visited your country and it's time to hunt turtles, then that totem, that person who carries the turtle totem knows what time of year to do it without interfering with the breeding season, you know, or the hibernation season with the turtles. You know, same with kangaroos, same with um, we do ritual, well, mosaic burning, you know, to keep country healthy and to keep it um, clear of weeds and that stops wildfires, you know. Um, that's the fire totem person would be in control of that. So when you have a system, when, when you have a colonial system where, you know, the British who, you know, they settled in 1826, they don't join Noongar culture. They don't collect totems of their own to look after. They don't join our society. They actually set up a society on top of our society and then spend 193 years making mistakes with country because they don't know about Noongar country, how different it is to Europe. And then they uh, kind of, you know, had a campaign against Noongar culture, which meant that, you know, by 1900, only 10% of our people were left, you know. And so all that knowledge, all that, um, the great encyclopedia of Noongar country, of, of a people long lived in place, you get a, you wind up with a fragmented knowledge system where those knowledges aren't getting passed on. And then from 1905 to 1970, you have the stolen generation so children are taken off their parents, Noongar children are taken off their parents' race and institutions. So you, even the people that are left don't have that, you know, passing on of knowledges. So this is devastating to the Noongar knowledge network um, as well to our, you know, our spirits in our country. So we are in like a revitalising phase at the moment. You know, we had our landmark land rights in the 90s and then, We've almost like been given permission to revitalize our cultures. You know, they've the government stopped our campaign against Noongar language and Noongar culture and Noongar sovereignty. Um, so when you want to uh, practice Noongar culture and to practice culture is to have boronga, to have totems, you really have to go discover these things for yourself. And so when trapdoor spiders came into my life, I'm like, well, you know, if I'm going to, you know, it's all about trying to live a good life on Noongar country, good for family, community, spirit and land. And so I practiced it through advocating for these trapdoor spiders. And so I had to go do that research that I didn't see was happening. I mean, I'm usually a language researcher. I'm usually in the archives and writing books and teaching language to people. But lucky I had a colleague who's a trapdoor spider ecologist and also Indigenous. And so she and I went round and we marked out all the spiders, the trapdoor spiders in the construction zone, which is about 200. And I was just, yeah, marking them up. And you can see these different colours are different sizes and ages. So the red is the grandmother, the orange is the mother, and then the yellow is the yearlings or the spiderlings. And so I did this, and it's like 115 metres of path that's getting replaced. But I spent this time with my totem, you know, it's a terrible circumstance. It's called a doomed population when this happens. They it got passed by the ecological people because there are spiders elsewhere in the park, but that's kind of not how I was thinking about it. I don't want to save all spiders. It's these ones that I developed a relationship with and could not abandon them to this Western kind of idea of what land is used for, which is in this case, a path to make greater ease for humans to walk through. But really these guys have been there a long time. And so we were digging up the spiders and moving them with, with permission. We've got all the permits and stuff. Um, and then we met someone who has designed traps, humane traps. So instead of digging up the spiders, which takes two hours and can kill them, you know, these traps get put on top of the burrow and it irritates them and then they come up uh, and trigger the trap and they get trapped in there and they don't get hurt. And so things like this, we've been doing this for about a year and we're so glad we came across Cameron Blackburn who like, oh, by the way, like 
invented a trap that's never been invented before here in the Southwest. Would you like it? They cost about $6 to 3D print. And these are my mates. And so you would never see these spiders. Uh, and you're not supposed to, right? These are these are your relatives who live in the earth being lovely and you don't interact with them, but they are a doomed population. And so it was this extraordinary sort of experience. And we're still, it's still ongoing. The path is going in in May. I've got another 60 to move. Um, but, yeah, this is a, a Proshimaka. And you can see her coming out of her um, out of her trap, you know, and I just I sung to it and I spoke Nunga to it and apologized for disturbing her, you know, and just saying, you know, this is um, not what I would have chosen. But as if I've committed to being in relationship with you, this is the this, this, this is my solution. I'm going to move you 150 meters from this path, knowing that they only ever move five metres in their lifetime, if that. And so this is another one. This is Cataxia bulganapensis. These guys are the ones that build the open burrows with the palisade and the leaf fan. And she looks dead on the right, but she is just playing possum. You know, like they're such docile, gentle spiders. And she's like, no, nah, I'm definitely dead, so don't eat me. I'm a leaf. Um, and then, yeah, this is actually, so what we do, we, we dig them up and then or, or, or catch them in the traps and then we move their burrow lid to a new location, dig them the start of a burrow and then put them in, which you guys will see here. So she's not dead. She's just pretending. We haven't got the sound on because I'm like singing and apologizing to it. I thought I'd leave that, spare you guys from that. So this is her new home. Oh, and there you go. She's decided she's, oh, this is all right. She comes back to life and goes into her burrow. And so, yeah, you know, my my advocacy and love of these animals had to go beyond the academic, beyond the kind of artistic or intellectual. You know, it's practising practicing culture, and I wasn't expecting to do that with these guys. They started out as just a focus point for my writing, to write about climate and communicate uh, the wonder of deep climate memory. Um, but, no, it's it takes action, and sometimes, you know, being part of, uh, the Noongar community and being an Indigenous person in the Western world, indige Indigenous cultural practice is is active. It's a verb, you know. Um, and so this is another species of, how much time do I have? I actually didn't press my uh, thing. Yeah, you're a little bit over, actually. I'm wondering if you could wrap up in a minute. Because sure, like we'll do. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, so I haven't talked about ancestor, my story, that is my fable, but that's all right. Um, you can ask me about that in the questions if you like. But uh, I'm responding to the spider in my writing, um, that line. The thing is, is that the Western other cultures have, re say, retained their spider stories or they're in the archive, Western archives, you know, so you don't know how accurate they are. They're in English, you know, so it's really tough. Um, but other cultures wrote down a lot more stuff than we did. So we don't know. There is actually, um, there's a, in, in Perth, there is one family that has trapdoor spider dreaming and they still dream, sing to trapdoor spiders. And I'm developing a relationship, you know, they're my neighbours essentially. I'm developing a relationship with them to say, you know, this is knowledge that needs to be revitalised on the South Coast. How do we go about that? You know, so it's not something we can look up in a book um, what trapdoor spiders mean to Noongar people. And I, I'm actively um, writing writing and creating that, you know, using science and being on country and stuff. Um, yeah, so I can tell. Let's have a look. So I'll just leave with this because I think this is important. This is what an elder has said. 
there's so much about our world, our old world, that has just so much for our new world, you know? And you just listen to a flock of cockatoos going through. There is nothing that you and I can teach them. Nothing, nothing. They know everything about being a flock, about being a community, about eking out an existence, about the language they use to connect and talk to each other. Cool. I'll wrap up there if you like. Thank you. Okay, that's perfect. Um, I'd like to open up for questions. So, um, and we're mindful that Alberto needs to leave um, probably before the session is over. So if there's questions for him that might be useful, but we'll entertain questions for anyone. And you can just raise your hand and, or just start speaking. And I'd like to welcome any of the presenters if they see any connections between their own talks or anything they've learned from one another to also share. Well, I'm, I'll just start. I'm wondering, Nathan, since you have the most scientific background, are are you aware of the spiders that Kath is talking about? And was the indigeneity perspective um, interesting, useful, unusual, different for you? Oh, it was beautiful. Really moving to me. I just absolutely love your efforts there, Cass, and how that weaves into your own story of place and people. I, I just think that's astonishing and wonderful and such a reminder of what indigeneity holds for us as a world um, and, and at what risk uh, our cultural systems of domination place that rich, deep connection to place and, and to knowledge. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really moved by that. I do know these trapdoor spiders, although not the specific ones that you were talking about, but I've had experiences with trapdoor spiders in Malaysia and Singapore, and they're incredible animals. I'm not surprised at all that you're so captivated by them. Um, they are gentle, they are um, architects of their own little worlds. And um, so, yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Great, Caroline, do you wanna ask a question? Hello, all. can you hear me? Yes, good. Thank you very much for the talk. Like I learned a lot. Um, I'm very happy to to participate on that. So, um, well, just to, to talk a little bit about me, like 10 seconds. Uh, I'm Caroline Fukushima. I'm based in Helsinki in Finland. And I work with taxonomy and conservation of spiders like more than 20 years now. So I'm feeling very old. <laughs> but it was very nice to hear everything that you talk about. My question is, with your experience, you think still people keep the, a negative view about spiders in general, or they are more keen to learn nowadays and they, they can see spiders with good eyes, let's say. Like, so so I, I'd like to hear with your experience with this, with the public in general, not spider lovers like I think us. Thank you. Oh, I guess, you know, I was, um, yeah, I was, and it's funny because I was quite arachnophobic as a child and teenager. And so um, it's really overwhelming to be arachnophobic. And uh, I did a project to, you know, recommended to try get proximity to spiders. And it was when I um, did a project on uh, Atrax robustus, which is the Sydney funnel web spider. It was a bit notorious for being aggressive and scary and very, very, very venomous um, and very big contact with people because huge amount of people live in its territory, you know, in its range. Um, but when I did a deep dive into them for this biology project in year 11, it, um, I saw how vulnerable they were. When you look in, when you see biology of them and see all their moving parts and see they've got little 
funny little ganglion brains and a little like open vascular system. They just seem so vulnerable and it takes it away from the uh, how, you know, scary it is of something that's got four paired appendages so it moves quite smoothly. Whereas, you know, insects have got tripod legs, so they're a little bit shakier, but a spider's like, you know. And so when I was pulling the spiders up uh, in the national park over the past six months, people were interested. They're walking past and they're like, oh, spiders. But then, you know, I'd spin them a bit of a yarn about Gondwana land and it just opened up something else to them. So I think the storytelling around spiders has been dominated, especially in Australia, by fear that people came to Australia and settled here and were just so scared of our animals when really they're the most vulnerable, well, you know, like soft, squishy, shy things. You know, the Sydney funnel web is pretty aggressive, but um, that's such a rarity, you know, in the spider world. Um, so I think we've got to spin a better yarn about them because once I tell once I kind of communicate my passion and interest and empathy for them, people tend to absorb it. People will just absorb your feelings about something. I find humans are quite empathic like that. And so, um, yeah, that, yeah, I think people, you hear people say dodgy things about spiders to their kids and that's where they're getting it from. But I think peacock jumping spiders being on the internet, changing the world, you know, they got those big puppy dog eyes and they are doing it well for brand spider, I think. So I think it is changing. Yeah, I would agree. I, you know, I, I've spent many, many years studying butterflies, which get an almost universal pass, even for people that hate insects or creepy crawlies. And my experience working with the public around spiders has been slightly different. I think people are simultaneously afraid of and fascinated by them. And that's a different kind of hook to engage people with. Oh, butterflies, you know, oh, I love butterflies. Whereas people, they're like, eh, they don't want to get very close. I'm sure, Cass, you probably had this experience with people asking what you're doing. There's this like drawback when they hear that you're working with spiders, but then kind of a lingering curiosity. And so I do, um, I think it's really apropos to this whole conversation that, um, that it's about the storytelling around spiders. Um, jumping spiders are wonderful uh, stories and um, they are small and they've got those big eyes. And one of the, I think one of the challenges of this interspecies storytelling is to be mindful of how we interject our own human stories. I mean, all of these parables and myths are full of human stories and not always the best human stories. And even in interacting with the popular press on jumping spiders, there's this urge to, to, inject sometimes really toxic toxic stories around like dangerous females or the choosy female that rejects all the males and then suddenly we're in this weird like incel space of like men feeling like women are just cold and dangerous and so i think we do really need to be cautious around our storytelling because people really want to see themselves in animals. And I think it's much better for people to see animals in animals and to respect them for, for example, Cass mentions vulnerability, ancient history of these spiders. There are other ways of telling stories that I think people are interested in that don't just simply propagate sometimes toxic narratives around human culture into the world of animals but that's a line that the public really wants to play at and so i think there's some craft and artfulness around the kind of storytelling we do that acknowledges or even winks at the humanness that we might impart to other animals but also reminds people that animals are their own beings <laughs> with their own magics and their own things to teach us. So I think it's a rich space to play, but also one that requires some discipline and thoughtfulness. Thank you. <laughs> Lucinda, do you want to ask a question? Oh uh, yeah, good morning. I I'm sorry I was late because it is morning here. Um, I, I I missed one presentation, Nathan. I came in in the middle of yours, so maybe you've answered 
uh, the question that I have. But first, I just want to make a comment in relation to previous. Here at the University of Illinois, um, the May Berenbaum, an insectologist, brought with her I from somewhere you know on the East Coast, uh, the Insect Fear Festival, and so it's like this big campy festival that we do every you know that I say we. It's really you know the um, it's really the the graduate students do every year where they. Uh, the movie theaters downtown are just filled with all of these, uh, all of these um, scare films, you know, about, about insects. So I, 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 this isn't really a question, it's a comment. I'm just wondering if camp and, you know, direct confrontation can also serve the function or help to promote empathy as well, as well as, you know, maybe undermining, I don't know, just a question you know, about the, the function of the Insect Fear Festival. But my real question is this, um, and maybe you address this, why are these spiders uh, evolving to be more colorful? <laughs> uh, great, great question. Um, I'll start with your main question first, and then I want to circle back to this kind of question about fear and its role in our storytelling yeah. too. Um, so, um, I'm going to start with the question of why spiders are re-evolving the ability to see color, because I think that that maybe holds some answers to why they're they're colorful. So um, we don't really fully understand why the basic ground plan of spider vision is um, really simple. Um, so for example, the genes that code for their color sensitivity are called opsin genes. And um, things like dragonflies can have 30 of them in their genomes and jumping spiders and most spiders only have three. So the question is, well, why do they have so many fewer? And one answer may be that deep in evolutionary history, for example, with those trapdoor spiders and other kinds of ancient spiders, that spiders were originally mostly nocturnal, or they were mo originally mostly underground, what we call fossorial. And so the idea is that they went through a period of time that was a bit like cave insects or cave spiders or cave fish can sometimes go through where vision is less important. And the components that are the building blocks for vision in the genome um, begin to decay, essentially, or atrophy. And that groups like jumping spiders or other hunting spiders like wolf spiders or lynx spiders that are now out in the daytime using vision to make their lives in the world have needed to, in a certain sense, rediscover vision. Um, there's the many ways in which they can improve their vision and it's just limited by mutations and the amount of time that they have to kind of stumble, if you will, across um, ways of improving their vision. Um, in most of the jumping spider groups that are brightly colored, it seems that the color, the ability to see color predates their use of color. And that makes a lot of sense. Why would you evolve bright colors if other individuals of your species can't even see them? But there is this hint that in some groups, they're using reds and oranges that they can't even see. And that's because they just look black to them and it's not any more costly than black to them. Maybe it's even cheaper to produce them uh, than black. And so they're not aware and there's lots of things. I mean, of course, flowers are a great example of a living thing that has no ability to see its own color. So it is also possible that there are colors that have evolved in the background and that when those animals evolve to be able to see color, um, then suddenly those colors have new meaning to them. Um, and they use color in a variety of ways from who, choosing who to mate with to choosing who to fight with um, to trying to avoid being eaten, etc. So there's a variety of purposes for color, um, but those seem to, those communicatory um, values to color seem to arise after the animals can see color itself. So hopefully that answers some of your questions about that. I mean, I think the other thing I would say is that Stories don't always have to be um, uplifting or cheerful, and there's a real role in storytelling for fear. 
and for ghoulish characters and you know the the suchigumo and these earth spiders in japan are monsters uh, they play a role for the shadow side of story and culture and i'm not opposed to spiders and other things that we have some inherent initial fear of also populating those kinds of stories because i think they belong in the canon of human experience and human storytelling so i'm um, I've actually been involved in a number of B movie kind of campy B movie horror movies and alien movies and things as a scientific consultant for reasons that I don't really quite understand why people reach out to me. But I think that there's there's appetite for those kinds of stories. I think those stories tell us something about the human experience that more lighthearted stories don't. And so I'm perfectly happy with spiders also inhabiting those shadowier stories. And I think there's a enduring interest in those that shows up in many of the traditional fables that we have variously referenced as well. So, um, so long as spiders are not just always the things that you're afraid of and want to stomp, um, I think I'm happy for them to be things that we're sometimes afraid of or play that role. Thank you. Uh, Tanya? Hi. Um... I, uh, speaking of stories, I would love to hear more from Cass about the fables that she can get time to talk about, um, that that sort of side of it, just to connect to what Nathan is saying um, and the fables we heard about in the first presentation. Sure, thank you. Yeah, so it's the, the context of writing animal stories in Noongar country is that because I'm a writer with a platform, people might mistake what I'm presenting to them as Noongar cultural heritage, right? There's a great hunger for, um, you know, Aboriginal heritage and knowledges in Australia because, you know, we've just been through the Black Summer bushfires, we have fire and flood. Um, you know, people who live in Australia are horrified and they're like, oh, you know, this actually didn't happen prior to colonisation. The landscape has been changed deeply since um, the arrival of the British. So people are so hungry for it. And the thing about Noongar knowledge is they're so good because they are been tested and tested and tested over and over through a climatic change even, you know, when the world warmed by nine degrees between um, 18,000 years ago and 7,000 years ago. And really human cultures took off after 7,000 years ago. That's when you see all the um, the Mesopotamia, you know, the fertile crescent, all that kind of stuff takes off because the world warmed and we could and people could grow crops, you know. So Europe develops and the Mediterranean develops. But, um, you know, like the lived-in knowledges are precious because, you know, the Noongar people got through the last climate change with cultures intact and that's what the west would like you know they're like oh how did you do that and there's sort of themes in our stories about moving inland and negotiating with your inland neighbors to live on their land because your land is inundated and protocol and that's why indigenous people in australia are so strong on territory and protocol because of these great movements in the past right those things are written onto our culture still they're burned on you know it was such an incredible thing to live through so when I write I it is a tough space to write in because we need new stories about country so that people can connect you know people who because I like you know talk to kids about climate anxiety you know and how you know maybe Noongar perspectives can help or what the elders are saying and they don't know they're in a globalized world where they belong everywhere and nowhere. So there is there is a need to to both revitalize fragments of myths back into stories and to write new stories. But we're in this space where people might mistake them for cultural knowledge. So my story ancestor is a little trapdoor spider who travels to the moon. So I'm hoping it's unusual enough that people will not mistake it for Noongar cultural knowledge. And it's kind of like um, two stories at once. Once this, One's a scientific narrative of the development of Earth's electromagnetic field and our relationship with the moon and where our, the moon came from and stuff. And the spider story is a little spider who gets a sense and they travel up through the atmosphere and they go to the moon. And when they get to the moon, there's um, 
Bankshire woodlands. I don't know if you guys know what in Australia we might have different sort of plants, but, you know, uh, Bankshires and woodlands and wetlands and stuff on the moon and they're all white. So this kind of, these two narratives are kind of a side by side so that people don't get comfortable in thinking this is a uh, traditional story, you know, it's not a dreaming story. But I get to express myself and my connection to country and land and ancestors through the spider, you know, all these things that I've kind of talked about already. Um, sometimes it's a, it's a relief to put yourself in an animal's perspective like that because it's really stressful being a, being a human, you know, and being like, you know, especially Indigenous people, we are just had this ocean of information flow over us and our young people and you have to negotiate all the knowledges in the world. And so when I got into the perspective of trapdoor spiders, you know, even with the vision thing, it's interesting being on here with Nathan because I had to go read all articles probably that he wrote about the different kinds of vision and immersing myself from that point of view um, took me out of myself and slowed everything down, you know, because they live these long, slow lives, these sessile lives in the ground. It was actually quite therapeutic to get into that uh, kind of character. And I want to offer that to people because it's hugely therapeutic to me. And having such a deep engagement with plants and animals of your area is a very, a very important in Indigenous culture. So I'm kind of in this funny in-between space and there's no roadmap in this space. There's no one else writing these myths back into life, you know, like, it's pretty, it's pretty rare. So I don't have any, a lot of peers or mentors, but I do have the support of the elders who are like, I'm like, is this too weird in our space? You know, when we're trying to revitalize culture and put on a strong face to the world and say, let us revitalize culture, let us repair and heal our communities. But they, they like the novelty of it. And really they say that indigenous peoples are not historical. We are contemporary and futuristic peoples, and we will continue to write stories um and we are inventive uh and that's how we got this far and so ancestor tells a story about connection through a trapdoor spider's point of view um about holding your ancestors close because at the end of the story the uh trapdoor spider contributes a thread that holds the moon close um so you know i think that there is a lot of tension around Indigenous stories and because it's so unusual, it kind of sneaks up on people, you know. There's a lot of people in Australia who don't like Indigenous people and, you know, are resentful of Indigenous voices getting a platform and this kind of sneaking it at them, you know, because it's not quite a dreaming story um, but is still place-based, spirit-centred storytelling. Um, so get back to me in like 10 years to see how I've gone with this. Thank you, but thank you for your question. Yeah, okay, so uh, Lisa Jin had to learn to attend a meeting, so do you have any other questions? I think Lucinda, you had a hand up. Yeah. I did. I asked a question of, of Nathan, but uh, Cass, if, as long as, you know, Cowrie has recognized me, may I ask you another question? I mean, how how important if at all is the work of somebody like Deborah Bird Rose to you know your sense of yourself as a as a scholar or um uh, you know and, and Tom Van Doren you know who is a non-indigenous person working on um who who attends to aboriginal uh uh stories yeah so I've had these um these writers recommended to me by Matt. You know, Matt Carillo is one of my um, colleagues at Curtin. And so, uh, yeah, it's just that, you know, my approach and the approach because I have um, my research lead is my uncle, you know, and he's a famous Noongar novelist and scholar. And so I've kind of absorbed a lot of his approaches, um, Professor Kim Scott. And the... <sighs> He, like, we're kind of reluctant to engage too much beyond our community, you know. So yeah. some of it, like, there is so much work to do in our um, field of revitalising language that we don't, mm, 
kind of aim to be experts in Indigenous or decolonial literatures, you know. Um, they're, the most important literature to me is land surveys and ecological um, surveys and archives of, you know, people who are in the reservations and missions and stuff. That at this point in my life, those are the most important things for me to know because they're not speculative, you know. Um, so I tend and I'm trying to start from a Noongar point of view for all things. Like um, mm. my that's why I had a bit of preamble about the context of Noongar country. So, yeah, I mean, I've, I've had it kind of beaten out of me because of uh, work doing community work and not so much I don't teach create like I've got creative writing background I had to give myself a crash course in climate during my PhD um but yeah my elders want to, want me to go to them and then generate research from their um wishes you know um and I don't know if that's going to get me jobs in university but it will um I'll always have to do independent projects and stuff you know but that is the the need. It's it's a very current need um, because my community are some of the most marginalised people in the world. Um, and if one of us gets into university, then we got to we got to work on the things that impacts people every day. So if I even get a little bit too speculative, uh, they're like, you know, what's what's the point of this? Why do you need to be an expert in international literatures? What's impacting on Noongar country? So, yeah, I guess the short answer is, uh, yeah, I'm not an expert in the broader literatures around animals. Um, and every time I read something, I do, I do really enjoy it. Um, but it's my world is a pretty small one. It's it's Noongar country and it stops at the borders um, because there's so much work here to do. And the more you learn about other places, the less you know about your own place. Um and so, yeah, I think studying climate and the kind of looking at the, the stress that plants, animals um, and waterways are under here in the southwest, you just can't take your eyes off it, essentially. Um, I don't know you. if that answers your question. <laughs> no, it does. I mean, that, that was a really useful and important answer. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anybody else has a question? Okay, so uh, yeah, we get to already that three o'clock, so yeah, we might stop. So, well, thank you so much for uh, yeah, researching into sharing the session so brilliantly, and thank you so much for our panelists for your fantastic papers, and thank you so much for everyone to coming along. And uh, we are having our next and the last speeches based session on. Uh, January 29th on Crow Fables, featuring John, Wim John Wimpenny, Kylie Swift, and Tom Van Duren. And I will post the information on our webpage soon, so please look out for it. And if you are interested in fables and getting involved in the project, please drop me a line. And thank you so much again, and hope to see you soon. Thank you, Kauri. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Nathan. Thank you.